Tia Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Panchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihe Vacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadigor Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone back to our Bhakti Vaibhav study of the third canto, Kapila Shiksha. Right? Did anyone manage to salvage Anything from the class yesterday? You have anything you remember? You could tell us. We'd like to hear what you learned or what you remember from the class yesterday. Okay. Yes, Prabhu. Please accept my humble obeisance. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Um, Raj, uh, one, uh, two things that stood out for me was you explained that the Sankhya philosophy is a combination of devotional service and mystic realization. Okay. And uh, secondly, uh, we spoke about we are very indebted to Shona Karishi because he was very keen to hear, he was very inquisitive. So we should uh, follow and adopt the same mentality. Thank okay. you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Yes. Someone else's hand is up there. Who is this? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, one uh, learning is uh, one has to be very tired from the material world in order to start uh, getting attracted to Krishna consciousness and start hearing on Krishna, Krishna Gatta. And uh, while talking on that, uh, you gave an example on uh, senses a man with five eyes. So he's been attracted by each of them and he is not able to compose himself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very interesting. You remembered that example. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. All right. So we'll go ahead now. Uh, we're going to. Let me see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what happened to you? Right. I'm going to share the, share this screen with you. Are you able to see okay, the slideshow? Yes, Maharaj. Good. Okay, so chapter 26, Fundamental Principles of the Material Nature. Uh, let's just to, we're going to review a little bit about what we covered yesterday as well just to refresh your memory, right? Devahuti had asked questions to Lord Kapila. This was uh, question three. She wants to know, what is the gyan by which one understands tattvas? That came up in text number 29. It's going to be answered in this chapter today, 26, as well as in 27. And then she had another question. What is the yoga mentioned by which, by you, which is aimed at the Lord for liberation? How many limbs does it have? And that will be answered in chapter 28, right? We'll hear about the Astanga Yoga there, 28. 
Okay, so that's uh, coming up. All right, then we, g we gave you this quote, the Lord describing Sankhya, quoted by you also, a combination of devotional service and mystic realization. <laughs> what exactly that mystic realization is could be many things. It could be the superiority of devotional service over jnana and uh, mukti, and it could be also that we get free of birth and death by this knowledge of Sankhya Yoga. Many different things that could be referred to, mystic realizations. I don't remember Prabhupada actually saying, this is the mystic realization. But we have to draw our own conclusions about that. All right, then we give you this quote also from Lord Kapila, describing the senses as being representatives of the demigods. And the mind is like the Supreme Lord. So that's from, from verse number 32. The the mind is meant to control the senses in the same way the Lord controls the demigods. So in pure devotional service with bhakti, the mind is engaged in the service of the Supreme Lord and the senses also, they're engaged for the pleasure of the Lord. We also spoke about how bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti. Did you all have an opportunity to read through these purports? Very important purports there. And yes, Maharaj. Prabhupada yes, gives different reasons. So you can tell me one reason. Some of you like to give me one reason why bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti? Uh, yeah. Yes, Mataji. Go ahead, Mataji. Thank you, Mataji. Thank, sorry, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, actually, uh, bhakti is practical, whereas uh, yoga is impractical. And in bhakti, uh, like, uh, in the, the impersonalist undergoes severe penances and austerities uh, to obtain uh, mukti. Whereas in bhakti, just by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, the Mahamantra, and uh, by, uh, by, uh, uh, it, accepting the remnants of the foodstuffs offered to the personality of Godhead, we can, uh, you know, we can attain uh, liber it is above liberation. Yes, very, very good. Yes, right. So bhakti is easily achieved. Uh, liberation is easily achieved for for a devotee, but the, for, for the jnani they struggle. The yogis and uh, the jnanis they struggle to get mukti, but for the devotee, it's easily achieved. Okay, some other reason, Prabhu? Uh, yeah, Maharaj, actually I have one question, actually in this one, uh, one of the purports it is mentioned that as soon as one engages uh, oneself in the uh, transcendental loving service of the God, then he is already liberated. And in some other purport it is said that uh, liberation is uh, not so easy because uh, one is entangled in the material because even a third class devotee is there and he is also liberated. So somehow or the other I could not understand both the meanings because in uh, verse number 32 and verse number 34 somehow it contradicts like in one place Prabhupada is mentioning in the purport that uh, the uh, devotee, uh, the person who engages his senses in the service of the Lord is already liberated. But actually, if we understand it in our own context, like my context, so I find that whenever I engage in the, so I don't find myself in a liberated state. I am still in the materially contaminated state. Well, <laughs> what to say? We, we have to come to the transcendental platform. That's the point, right? We have to transcend the material body. Yes, if, if, if we're still thinking of sense gratification, then our devotional service will be influenced by the modes of nature. And that will be discussed later on in another couple of chapters. We'll hear, chapter 29 describes about the, how the modes of nature influence devotional service. So just because we're, we may be 
chanting Hare Krishna or worshipping the deity doesn't mean that we're liberated, but we have to actually do it with the proper mood, with the proper uh, state of mind. And this is brought out, this was brought out with the final verse of the 25th chapter spoke about put, fixing the mind, right? Tivrena bhakti yogena, intense practice of devotional service. So yes, it, in, in some ways it's easy, but in, in, in other ways it's not so easy, right? I, I think what, what Prabhupada said is simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> I never said it would be, he said it's simple, what you have to do is simple enough, but it's not so easy to actually do it. So to actually do it with the pro, in the proper mood, in the proper frame of mind, for the pleasure of Krishna that we're doing this as a service for the Supreme Lord. And we recognize the Lord as the Supreme, and He's our Master, our Lord and Master, and we're His insignificant servant. So the mood has to be right. We want to do devotional service. We want to come to that liberated platform. We have to be free of passion and ignorance. That is but maybe not so easy for us. We may think that's not so easy. We have to get rid of the influence of these lower modes, come to the transcend to come up to the transcendental platform. So that's important. We've been hearing about that in many different places, the importance of cultivating the mode of goodness. So you want to be transcendental, you want to come to that state, we have to get free of the influence of those lower modes. Now how to do that? Well, we, we simply have to engage ourselves in the practice of Krishna consciousness. You have to chant Hare Krishna. Again, you have to do it with the right state of mind. And we have to do it intensely. We have to do it faithfully, regularly, sincerely. And then bhakti, you know, that's bhakti. And that is the liberated platform. Is it difficult? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Actually, in the uh, purport of uh, text number 32, Prabhupada says, actually, uh, if I say the exact sentence, unless one is liberated, one cannot engage the senses in the service of the Lord. And then in uh, purport of text number 33, uh, Prabhupada says, one's liberation begins immediately as soon as he engages himself in the service of the Lord. So these two statements, how we can understand together? Well, how to engage yourself in the service of the Lord. That means body, mind and words in the service of the Lord. It's not, it's not a contradiction. There's no contradiction there. We use our senses in the service of the Lord. One is liberated when you use the sense. We just have to do that. We have to apply the teaching. Do it. Engage our senses in, serv in the service of Krishna. And that is the liberated platform. Prabhupada said, how many pure devotees are on the planet? Prabhupada said, how many members do we have in our society? He said, they're all pure devotees. Now there's different levels of pure devotees. In the same way you could say there's different levels of liberation. You know, some people are really, they're way up there and other, others, you know, we're, we're just getting free. We're just, just getting out of the modes of nature. But if we apply the teachings, then we're liberated. You're anxious. You know you're not the body, you know you're a spirit soul, you know your soul is related to Krishna as a servant. We have to apply it, we have to do service in that mood as a humble servant. That is liberation. Yeah Maharaj, but it is said that until and unless we are liberated, we cannot uh, serve uh, with our senses, uh, mind and body. So, in other words, like if we are, if I am not liberated, then how can I serve? And if I am serving, then the precondition is that liberation is there. But I am not liberated, so how am I serving? Well, you can be liberated. How do you get liberation? You have to chant Hare Krishna, you have to do devotional service. 
And you have to apply it, apply the philosophy. Use the body, mind and words in the service of Krishna. You're a liberated soul. Yes, Maharaj. Now if you do that, then you're on the liberated platform. You use your body, mind and words in the service of Krishna. You're liberated. Why you doubt it? Why? Why? What's the problem? You just have to follow the instruction. Use your senses, use your mind, your the body, mind and words, use the, all of these things in the service of Krishna. So we have to have that, that mood, that, that surrender. And that's, that is devotional service. It begins on the liberated platform. We want to be liberated. You, you, sometimes, Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, sometimes you don't realize you're liberated, but you're actually liberated. He, said, he gave the example, just like you go in the airplane, you sit in the airplane, the air, one minute the airplane's on the ground in the, in the airport, and then the next minute the airplane's up in the sky over the city, thousands of feet up in the air. You didn't feel any big change. So the same way, liberation, you don't feel any big change, but actually you're liberated. If you're, if you're following the, the process, and the process is to use the body, mind and words in the service of the Supreme Lord. Right? So, yes, yes, Maharaj, I understood that what you are saying is that if we follow the process, then we are on a liberated state, though we may not realize our position like you mentioned the example of aeroplane. Uh, hitting the sky and uh, taking off and we may not realize the height of the aeroplane. So similarly, we may be in the liberated state, but we may not realize, but we have to continue to follow uh, the process of devotional service with sincerity and determination uh, with the perfect mood of surrender. Yes, right. You've got it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. All right. Any other reasons why Bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, was just, uh, Hare Krishna. I was just thinking that uh, Bhakti is superior because it helps us to control the mind. Yes. How? How does that work? Doesn't, yo doesn't a yogi also control the mind? Doesn't a jnani also control the mind? Yes, but uh, because the mind uh, controls the senses, so engaged in Krishna's services, it actually helps us to control the senses. It brings the mind under control. Just a thought. Hmm. It's difficult for me to see the, you know, to see the superiority of bhakti over jnana and yoga, because they're all controlling the mind. But as you, when you bring up service, of course in bhakti, you engage the senses in service. So that's, that's something different. The, the, use the senses in the, for the service of Krishna. Now that is something which the yogi and the jnani, they're not going to do. Yes. The senses to attract sense objects. I don't think that's a correct explanation. So, by performing devotional service, now we're going backwards, where we are able to attract, where the uh, mind now is not going to tell the senses to attract the sense objects. So, by performing devotional service, we control the mind. Yes, certain, just, just certainly there's a difference there. The bhakti, in bhakti, we're not going to the mind is not going to tell us to just enjoy the sense objects, but the mind is going to engage the senses in the service of Krishna. That is bhakti. That was explained in text 32, I think, uh, about the, we were talking about the demigods and the Supreme Lord and comparing it to the senses in the mind. So the mind is meant to engage the senses in the service of Krishna, and that is bhakti. If the senses just want to enjoy the sense objects, that is, that is not bhakti. Yes. Um, Maharaj, uh, 
And I just have a question from the text that it in the pop pot, if I could only ask. Yeah. Wait, a Kapila Dev said that when he senses without desire for material profit or other selfish motives, I engaged in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one is situated in devotional service. So, uh, you know, Srila Bhaktivedanta Thakur, when he was building the temple at the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he asked for one rupee, explaining that Mahaprabhu wanted to engage everyone in the Sankirtan movement. So, uh, we, when we go out, let's say, on collection for the temple, for example, to sign ETGs uh, from people from the public. We engage someone to come and fix the plumbing at the temple. So they're not devotees. Uh, so I wanted to find out in this context of this book that I read, is that obviously it's considered a devotional service, but for a person's attitude is, is okay, I'm doing something for a good cause, but they're supporting the Sankirtan movement. Do we perceive it as devotional service based on what I just read in this purport? Well, I would think it's more Agyata Sukriti. Okay. They're not yet devotees. They're not really up to performing devotional service, but they can do some piety which can bring them to the state of devotional service. So that's the idea. Get them engaged, to let them do some pious activities, huh? Yesham Twantigatam Papam Jananam Punya Karmana. Like Punya Karma, this is Punya Karma. We call it Agyata Sukriti. Unknowingly, they're doing activities which can help them to come to devotional service. So that is the business of devotees, to engage people in the service of Lord Krishna. They're exploiting the resources of Lord Krishna. Their hard-earned money and everything actually belongs to Krishna. And it's meant for the service of Krishna, but they spend it in sense gratification. So if they give one rupee for the service of Lord Krishna, it's to their eternal benefit. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Just one quick question. Uh, you know, if we get brahmacharis that go into the temple, let's say sometimes their parents, uh, not out of service to a Vaishnava or service to Krishna, but they support a particular uh, brahmachari or brahmacharini in the temple, let's say by paying for the medical aid or covering their expenses, supporting them. Is it uh, uh, here again considered as a data security or are they engaged in devotional service? It will, serving... it will depend on them. Where are they? What is their mood? Are they doing it as a service for Krishna and for Lord Krishna's devotees? They actually know like that, that this person is a devotee of Lord Krishna and we want to serve him because he's, he's, because he's a, 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 a sincere servant of Lord Krishna and therefore I want to help him. Uh, do, do they do it with that mood or do they just do it, oh, okay, I want to do some pious and let me help somebody. I have money, I can give something for somebody else. And Do they do it in the mood of just charity or do they actually do it for Krishna? It will depend on their consciousness, their attitude. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else like to offer something about Bhakti being superior to yoga and mukti? May I add, Maharaj? Please, Prabhu, please do. Yeah, actually, uh, it is mentioned that uh, the uh, jnanis and yogis, they are engaged in all kinds of austerities and penances. And they may be at the brink of spiritual realization uh, by merging in the Brahman. But still, there is a chance of fall down because there are not trans transcendental activities. There is no service of the Lord. There is no love of Godhead. So they, they are, are always in the risk of fall down. Whereas, even a third class devotee engaged in the devotional service, he is transcendentally situated and he is much more elevated uh, towards the perfection of human life. Oh, very good. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, very nice point. Yes. Yes, the devotee's position is more secure than that of the jnani and the yogi. 
Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Anything else? Anyone? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. <coughs> Maharaj, uh, uh, devotional service is far, far superior than the other processes because it's a transcendental in nature. And uh, it's a stage after the yoga. Uh, there is a great pleasure in doing the service. Simply we have to control the tongue, nothing else. Chant and the Krishna Prasad, that's all. Okay, so you're, sa you're saying bhakti is much easier. Yeah. Just have to control the tongue. <laughs> that can be a big thing. That's the most difficult thing to control. Of all the senses, the tongue is the most difficult to control. But we have a nice process to control the tongue, right? As you said, our process is chanting Hare Krishna, nice kirtans, and, and taking nice Krishna prasadam. We don't have to do dry austerities like the jnanis and yogis, and we don't have to do monavrat, sitting in silence. No, we can hear about Krishna and talk about Krishna and chant the names of Krishna and beautiful songs about Krishna in Krishna's pastimes using our tongue. It's, it's so pleasurable. But yoga, for, for, to practice yoga and, uh, and, and cultivate jnana for, in order to get liberation, it's a very long, austere process. And you have to go away from the world and you have to go into seclusion and practice silence and things. So a very different process. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes? Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, may yes. I ask a question? Yes, please do. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, could you tell me what is Parabrahman? What? Parabrahman. Uh, text number 41, Parabrahman. Parabrahman. Yes, yes, Maharaj. So, Bhakti is what? Uh, Bhakti is cultivating understanding of the Parabrahman. Okay. Parabrahman means uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead. Right? Yes. Okay. Parabrahman means the Supreme Personality of Godhead, right? In Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says to Krishna, you are the Supreme Brahman. Param, param Dham Param Brahm Pavitram Paramam Bhavan. Right? Arjuna says in 10th chapter like that. Lord Krishna is described as Parabrahman, the Supreme Brahman. Right. Okay. So, I, I, so the yogis and the jnanis, they don't know the Parabrahman. They only know Brahman. So in that sense, you could say bhakti is superior. To is that your point? Is, yes, Maharaj. I just I need I want to know more about the meaning of parabrahman. Oh, you wanted to know the meaning of parabrahman. Oh, okay. Anyway, this bringing up this point is another reason why bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti, because the bhak, the bhakta the practice of devotional service, we know Parabrahman, we understand the Parabrahman, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. But the yogis and the jnanis, they don't. They only know the Brahman. They have no realization of the Parabrahman. So this is another way in which bhakti is superior. Thank you for bringing that up. Good point. Okay. We'll go ahead. Here's the final text of the 10th chapter. Notice the third line, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena. Do you remember this line from another verse in the second canto? Anyone? You've all studied the second canto? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Right, very good, right. Right. Whether you have all material desires or no material desires or desire liberation, but still you should practice the, the worship of the Supreme Lord with intense devotion, just like it's described here, that persons whose minds are fixed on the Lord engage in the intensive practice of devotional service. This is the meaning of Tivrena Bhakti Yogena. Tivrena Bhakti. 
This is the only means for attainment of the final perfection of life. Right? We want Krishna consciousness, we have to control the mind. And then this other point about the mind, Mano Maya Arpitam Stiram. First of all, the mind should be engaged at the lotus feet of the Lord, very steadily and naturally, because the mind is the master of the senses. When the mind is engaged, all the senses become engaged. That is Bhakti Yoga. So first of all, just like Maharaj Ambarish, we remember the verse, Maharaj Ambarish is doing devotional service. Who knows the verse? About Maharaj Ambarish, how did he engage his senses in Krishna consciousness? Anyone? Harikishna Maharaj, like, uh, uh, like he used his eyes to see Krishna, and he used his tongue to uh, chant, and to uh, uh, read. I mean, and to speak about this pastimes that way. He he used his hands for. Uh, I mean. Uh, you you don't know the verse. You never learned the verse, huh? Uh, I don't remember. Savai mana Krishna parara vindavoy. Savai mana Krishna padara vindayoy vachamsi vaikunta gunar nuvarnane. Like that, the verse, first, what is the very first thing he did? The very first thing he did? Savai mana Krishna padara vindayoy. He engaged his mind at the lotus feet of the Lord, Lord Krishna. Very first thing he did. And here the same point is made in Sankhya Yoga. You can see how Sankhya Yoga is Bhakti Yoga. First of all, the mind should be engaged at the lotus feet. Right? So that is Bhakti Yoga. All right, connection with the previous chapter. We're going on to chapter 26. Someone please read for us. Hare Krishna. Being requested by his mother, Lord Kapil first described Bhakti Yoga, which is the heart of Sankhya. Now in this chapter, he will equip us with the text of knowledge by which we can cut material attachments and then practice pure devotional Right, the acts of knowledge. Did you hear, do you remember this from Bhagavad Gita? Do you remember the acts? Where, would the, where did we hear about that? Cutting the tree, remember? In chapter 15, by the axe, you have to cut the banyan tree. Yes, right. You have to cut the banyan tree. How do you cut it? With the axe of what? Axe of knowledge. Axe of knowledge. That axe, the axe of detachment and knowledge, right. By knowledge you get detachment, mentioned here, with the acts of knowledge by which we can cut material attachments. So the acts of knowledge, the acts will cut the attachments. So this chapter will give us that knowledge. Keep, keep reading Prabhu. In chapter 26, Kapila will discuss about Jnana, Sankhya, answer to question 3. The manifestation and characteristic of the elements such as Maha, Mahatantva, the universal form composed of those elements and the being brought to life by the entrance of the Lord. Okay, so we're going to hear about all these things. Here's the overview of the chapter. It's a, it's a long chapter, of course. It's like 72 verses in this chapter. It's a big chapter. And it's very analytical in places. And very philosophical in the beginning. The first 10 verses are really, <laughs> first 8 verses are quite tough, long purports, phil philosophy. So the first 8 verses describe liberation by understanding the different categories of the Absolute Truth. And then goes on to describe the 24 elements and the time factor. Now you've already covered the 24 elements, you've heard about creation, 
Even 24 elements was brought up in the Bhagavad Gita. But in the second canto you had creation, in the third canto you had creation. So 24 elements is there, nothing new. And then goes on to the manifestation of the subtle elements from the Mahatattva. Right? You know what the Mahatattva is? Anyone remember what's the Mahatattva? What's the subtle elements? Is it the um, is it the unmanifested elements of the material of creation, Raj? Mahatattva is not the unmanifested elements. No. Way around. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's the other way around. Uh, we'll go over it. We'll go over it anyway. And anyway, the chapter goes on to explain about evolution of the gross elements from ether to earth. Right? The creation comes about from subtle to gross. So the subtlest element is ether, and the grossest element is earth. We know earth, water, fire, air, ether. So the creation comes about from subtle to gross, from ether to air, to fire, to water, to air. That's how the evolution takes place. And then we hear about the universal coverings and the universal form. It's all described. So it's a big chapter. Don't worry, we'll go through it, the main points anyway. So the benefit, what is the benefit of hearing Sankhya philosophy described in the first verse? Someone read for us, please. Hare Krishna. Um, Sri Bhagavan Vacha Athate Sampa Vakshyami Tatvanam Lakshanam Prithak Yadviditvam Vimuchita Purusha Prakrita Gunai. The personality of Godhead Kapila continued. My dear mother, now I shall describe unto you the different categories of the Absolute Truth, knowing which any person can be released from the influence of the modes of material nature. Right. So what's the benefit of the Sankhya philosophy? We'll get release from the modes of material nature. In other words, liberation. We can get liberation freed from the modes of nature. That is liberation, right? To overcome the modes of nature. Described here. Please read for us, Prabhu. Keep reading. I will describe the different features of the material elements, knowing which one is freed from the influence of the material modes, attains perfection of self-realization, cuts the knot of attachment to the material world. Okay. So, isn't it nice? <laughs> we can get so much benefit by hearing this Sankhya philosophy. Freed from the modes, self-realization, and get free of all the attachments to the material world. So, text 3 to text 8 are describing about the Jiva, Prakriti and Purusha and their interactions and characteristics. Jiva. The living entity, Prakriti, material nature, and Purusha, the Supreme Lord. These things come up again and again. Here we see, we've taken from text number three, the different characteristics of the Purusha. Purusha meaning the Supreme Soul, the Supreme Lord. So he is described as Anadi, without beginning. He is nirguna, he is transcendental to the modes of nature, prakriti para, beyond the material world, pratyagdhamma, perceivable everywhere, swayam jyoti, self-effulgent. We are taking light from everywhere else, but he is self-effulgent. Vishwam yena, samanvitam by whom the entire creation is maintained. So these are the characteristics of the Purusha. We can see, we cannot be the Purusha. We're not, we cannot do these things. We don't have these characteristics. But the Supreme Lord, He has, He can do them. So He's the real Purusha. Then text 5 to 7, 
particularly talk about the interaction between the jiva and the prakriti, how we interact with the material nature. And then text 9 describes more about the prakriti and the purusha. We were talking about the unmanifested stage, right? The pradhan. The pradhan means the unmanifested stage of the material nature, described here of yaktam, unmanifested. Hmm. And the pradhan is also eternal. The elements of the material nature are eternal. Sometimes they're manifested, sometimes they're not, but they're eternal. Prabhupada gives the example about the clouds. He said, just like clouds, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. But they're all, it's always there, it's not some new creation. And then, sad asad atmakam, consisting of cause and effect. Prakritim prakriti prahu. They call avisham undifferentiated, visheshavat, possessing differentiation. So the pradhan is undifferentiated, but at the same time it has the ability to differentiate. It can, it, 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 it will, when, when the elements are manifested, when they come to the stage of prakriti, then they, they, they can differentiate. Or when they come actually to mahatattva, then you can differentiate between the different elements, the different elements of material creation. Here you see the 24 elements of the Pradhan. You know all that. You've covered this before in the previous classes. You have the five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. You have the five tanmatras, meaning the sense objects, like touch, smelling, tasting, seeing, hearing. You have ten senses, ten senses, five knowledge acquiring and five working senses. And you have four internal senses, or if you like, the subtle, the mind, intelligence, false ego and chitta, or consciousness. Alright, and so it's described here, undifferentiated but possessing differentiation. Here's a nice quote, Prabhupada explains from the Bhagavad oh, just a minute, from the Bhagavad Gita. Someone like to read this for us? One who understands this philosophy concerning material nature, living entity and the interaction of the mode of nature is sure to attain liberation. He will not take birth here again regardless of his present position. All right. We want to understand this philosophy of the material nature, that's prakriti, the living entity, the jiva, and the interaction. Another quote, please read. Keep reading, Prabhu. This material world is working by the conjunction of the soul and the 24 material elements. One who can see the constitution of the whole material manifestation as this combination of soul and material elements, and can also see the situation of the Supreme Soul, becomes eligible for transfer to the spiritual world. These things are meant for contemplation and for realization. And one should have a complete understanding of this chapter with the help of the spiritual master. So this is from Bhagavad Gita, 13th chapter. Uh, 13th chapter, of course, describing the Purusha, Prakriti and the living entity, material nature, consciousness, right? Material nature, consciousness and the enjoyer. Uh, so 13th chapter Prabhupada talks about the importance understanding this knowledge, the constitution of the whole material manifestation. 
is the combination of the soul and material elements. And at the same time, see the situation of the Supreme Soul. Okay, now I want to go to another PowerPoint presentation for a minute and just show you something else. Okay, can you see this PowerPoint? Are you able to see this PowerPoint? No, my brother, I can watch. You can't see it? No, okay. <laughs> Wait, how, how do I do this now? Uh, you have to minimize the other one and you can do this well i did that i minimized the other one but somehow it looks like it's frozen stop the screen sharing and do it again Manage. okay oh yeah close the screen right do it share again Manage. now you can see oh no wait not that I have to share the screen, is it not? Yeah, you have to share the screen. Now you can see it? Yes, Maharaj, we can see it. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, this is to help to get these uh, different terms in to our minds to understand properly. Okay, the benefits of Sankhya Yoga. We spoke about that a little bit, right? We said, get free from the modes and cut the attachments. Okay, we're clear about that. Then the Supreme Lord, the Purusha, the Supreme Soul, His nature described here. He has no beginning. Are you able to see this okay? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes. He, he's transcendental to the modes, he's perceivable everywhere, he's self-effulgent. So this is the nature of the personality of Godhead. And here you see the comparison between the Prakriti and the Purush. Remember the Purush, we said, this is the Supreme Lord himself, the personality of Godhead. So he's a, the Lord is completely spiritual. And Prakriti is a material nature, material principle. And so we say the Lord fully spirit and Prakriti is substance. The Purusha is the cause and the Prakriti is the manifestation, or if you like, the effect of the cause. And one is divine within, divine without comparison between the two, the Prakriti and the Purush. Here you see comparison between the Pradhan, the Prakriti and the Mahatattva. We should understand these terms nicely, right? So Pradhan is described, at the bottom you can see, when material nature is not manifested and non-differentiated. So this is the material nature in its subtle stage. But Prakriti, it is manifested but not differentiated. What does that mean? It's not different, I mean you, it means you can't distinguish the different elements because they're all mixed together in the Prakriti. Just like Halava, right? You, everyone knows how to make halava. You have suji and you have butter and sugar and you put them all together. So when you get the halava, you can't see the butter or the sugar. It's all within, it's all combined together. And so Prakriti is like that. It's like the halava or like the, maybe it's like a, a bit like kichiri, which is all merged. So Prakriti is manifested but not differentiated, but the Mahatattva, it's manifested and differentiated. So the Mahatattva is the final the stage together. 
where everything is distinguished, you can distinguish the different elements. Is this clear to everyone? The Pradhan, Prakriti, Mahatattva, you okay with this? Yes, Maharaj. And may I ask a question about the Mahatattva? Okay. Um, the the Mahatattva becomes differentiated by the by the glance of of um, Vishnu, or is it the glance and the time element? Because we learned it uh, before, and I think uh, in previous chapters, but I cannot remember. Yes, well, it's explained differently in different places, usually by the time element, yes. The time element and the effect of the modes of nature, the Mahatattva comes about. Okay, thank you. Okay, Pradhan, the twin, Pradhan, the subtle stage. Right? We said in pr the stage of Pradhan, that it's, the material nature is not manifested and not differentiated. So, within the Pradhan, you have everything. The aggregate elements. The aggregate elements means all the different elements together. The gross elements, the subtle elements, the internal senses, and the working senses. Twenty-four. Right? Mentioned here, all these different elements. And then, just finally here, Pradhan, the twenty-four elements, material nature is not manifested and not differentiated. Prakriti is a manifested stage of existence, but not differentiated. And the Mahatattva is not destroyed. It's not destroyed at the time of annihilation. It swallows the darkness, it covered the effulgence at the time of dissolution. And here you see how the different elements of the material nature come into being. The different senses, the subtle senses, how it's all coming about. We have from the Mahatattva, we get the material ego. And the material ego is influenced by the three different modes. So the three different modes have different effects. From the mode of goodness, the interaction of the mode of goodness pr produces the mind. False ego in the mode of goodness, from out of the false ego in the mode of goodness comes the mind. And from out of false ego in the mode of passion comes intelligence. The functions are described there. And then from false ego in the mode of ignorance, we have the senses, the knowledge acquiring senses and the working senses. This is an important, it's a, we, want, we want to try to remember these things. The, the, the intelligence comes out from the false ego in the mode of passion and the mind comes from the false ego in the mode of goodness. And here we see uh, further creation taking place from false ego in the mode of ignorance. First of all, sound comes about. And from sound, then you get the ethereal sky and the sense of hearing. But everything comes about from sound. I was saying the creation comes about from subtle to gross. So sound is the beginning of the creation. So you have this from sound, you get the sky and the sense of hearing. And that's the only thing which can be observed within sound. There's nothing else. There's no other activity, no other element. And after, after sound then comes about from the ether, the next element to be created with the impulse of time, under the influence of time, again, false ego in the mode of ignorance, comes about air and subtle element, the subtle element of touch. 
So it begins with ether, and then the sense of hearing is there in sound. And with air, then you get touch. And with, with the sense of touch, there's, uh, you, can, you can perceive things like heat and cold. And then after the sense of touch, after the air, the next element is fire. And with fire you have forms. The eyes can see different elements, you can perceive different elements with the eyes, you will see the form. Just like fire, fire can be a big fire, maybe a little fire, we will see it in different ways. And this way all the elements are created one after another, right? After the fire, next one is water, and with water you get a tongue and a sense of taste, and then after water comes earth, and with earth you have the aroma or the, the sense of smell in the nose. So in this way the five different gross elements are created. So when all the elements are created, then the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the feature of Garbhadakshaya Vishnu enters within each universe. And accompanying him with all the seven primary elements, the five material elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, and along with that comes the total energy, the Mahatattva, and the false ego. So this is the seven primary elements shown here. Seven primary elements, the five material elements, the total energy or the Mahatattva and the false ego. And they are aroused into activity and un unified and, and what is it? United. United, United by the presence of the Lord, right? Okay, so. You see, this is how the creation coming about. In the beginning, the manifestation of the material energy. So this, is, you know, can see Brahma is not involved. Brahma is not even created yet. He hasn't taken birth yet. This is the primary creation. And this work is all done by Lord Vishnu. And then we're told also about the different layers of the earth and how they increase in thickness one after another. And within the egg is the universal form of Lord Hari, whose body, the 14 planetary systems, are parts. And that brings you to the universal form, the creation of the universal form, the Virata Root. Okay? So going back to our original uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one question? Yeah, please. Yeah, Maharaj, uh, in one of the uh, slides that you just showed, uh, you mentioned that uh, the internal elements, one is Chitta, one of the internal elements, Chitta, which you mentioned as consciousness. Yes. But uh, this, uh, how to understand this consciousness as the internal element? Consciousness is internal. Because consciousness is just uh, the part of the uh, soul only. Uh, if the soul is there, consciousness will be there. But other elements like mind, intelligence and ego, they are subtle elements. But chitta, consciousness, consciousness is soul only. So soul is not a material element. Soul, of course, is not a material element. You're talking about conscious, but about chitta, consciousness, right? Our consciousness can be, it depends where is our consciousness placed? Is our consciousness focused on the material or on the spiritual? Okay, Maharaj, but consciousness is to do with the function of soul. So uh, it cannot be material element or am I thinking in a wrong way, Maharaj? Well, you have to understand there's different levels of consciousness. What kind of consciousness are we speaking about? Okay, so basically the internal, the 24 elements, the chitta is basically referring to the material consciousness. 
Yes. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Definitely. Are you able to see this? No, Maharaj. The screen is not shared. Oh, okay. Okay. How do I do this? Once again, Maharaj, I'll make you the host. Okay. You can try the screen sharing now, Maharaj. Okay. Right. Okay. Recording in progress. How far did we get? wrong one. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. All right, can you see this now? Yes, Maharaj. Recording in progress. Okay, so we're back with this. How far did we get? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, not that. All right, so now we're going to do some group work. How many people have we got here today? 18, Maharaj. Excluding me and you, it is 17. It is how many? 17? Yes. Okay, so we want four groups. So one group will be five people, right? It will be four to five, Maharaj. Yeah, Maharaj. four to five in each group, right? Four groups we want, four groups. Make four groups. 
They have done much. Right? All good. And then group one, we want you to give us an explanation of Pradhan and Prakriti, the 25 elements, and then differentiate between Nirguna and Saguna Brahman. So that shouldn't take you very long. Then group two, you're working with text number 19 to 30. Group two, group one is text 10 to 18. Group two, text 19 to 30. And group two will tell us, what is the Mahatattva? Define it for us. Explain consciousness, false ego, mind, intelligence, and their presiding deities. Okay, so that's a nice exercise for group two. Group three, working with text 31 to 49, summarize the transformations of the gross elements from ether to earth, along with their specific qualities. Not very difficult. All right, and then group four, Text 50 to 71, explain the universal coverings and describe the Virata Rup, giving us practical lessons from it. So, how long do you need? 10 minutes? 15 minutes? Maximum. Ten minutes, Maharaj. I've shared it. I've shared the questions in the WhatsApp. So yes. They, our group there. They okay. can find out their questions. Can right. you open the rooms? Yeah. Please join the rooms. record If you can't, please let me know right now. Sachitanai Prabhu and Dineshwar Prabhu, can you hear me? I can hear you, Maharaji. Oh. I request you to join the rooms. Hare Krishna. Yes, they should join the room. That means they're not, they're not actually there, right? Yeah, seeing so much. <laughs> when we come to group where it catches them out. <laughs> this is a problem with having things online. Who's actually there? Oh, okay. Sometimes they go to restrooms or somewhere else when the sessions are happening. So right, because of that. that's true, yeah. Maharaj, I'm just going into the rooms to check out whether they're doing it. Okay. 15 minutes, I'm just tracking from now on. Mm -hmm. So give me five minutes, Maharaj. I'll just go into all the rooms and come back.
Some of the groups are just reading Maharaj. Yes, they will have to read, right? They'll start the discussion in under three minutes, so it will take 155, we'll close down the rooms. Okay, yeah. I'll be back by 1.15. I'm
I've intimated everybody that five minutes is left, Maharaj. Okay, thank you. I'm closing the rooms. Okay.
Recording in progress. Welcome back, everybody. Maharaj, you can continue. Hare Krishna. All right. So, can we have a spokesman for Group One? I feel well, like. Before we do, Maharaj, we thought that because we all just, um, each of us took different. Oh, good. Okay. Places. So each group, each person can explain their three parts. So yeah. we can have a different spokesman for each part. So who would like to explain first of all Pradhan and Prakriti for us? Hare Krishna. Yes. Um, Maharaj, I will explain the uh, Pradhan. Uh, the verses I had, I took two verses. So in, in um, it just explains very briefly about Prakriti, but about Pradhan it explains very, um, um, very explicitly. It's when all the elements are in the state that nothing is mixing and the three modes are there and they're not mixing and there is no reaction, no action and no reaction. Um, and the Mayavadis, they tend to say that uh, Pradhan is actually the Brahman, but Prabhupada explains that it's not it's not like that because in the brahman there are, the three modes are not not present at all but in the in the padhan the modes are there but they're not mixing okay and, and also the padhan is also nitya it is eternal mm. um yeah um prakriti is the state when the when the the three modes um, uh, yeah, um, so it's the manifest stage, as we've already said. Right, uh, yes, manifest, uh, right. Pradhan is the unmanifested stage and Prakriti is the manifest stage, right? Yes. And in the Pradhan, there's no uh, we're not able to differentiate the different elements. What about in Prakriti? Yeah, I didn't state about Prakriti if you can... Um, differ no, it's not differentiated, sorry. Prakriti is not differentiated, it is just manifested. Right. Right, Prakriti, there's no differentiation there also, but it's manifest, right? Okay, fine. Okay, go on, going ahead, let's hear about the 25 elements. Yes, Maharaj, um, this is covered in 12 to 13, although actually just 20 of the elements is covered in 12 and 13. So there isn't any purple, it's just a straightforward list. So, for instance, the five gross elements, as we know, is earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Then is given the five subtle elements, which yes. is smell, taste, color, touch, and sound. Then the, Just um, a minute, let's hear these again. The five subtle well, elements. Subtle, yeah. Smell, taste, color, touch, and sound. Color, touch, and sound. Uh, smell, this is the sense objects then. Okay. This um, is because there, there are five, right? You said five elements? Yeah. Let me just look again in the verse um, 12 and 13. Um, yeah, there, there are five gross elements, uh, namely earth, water, fire, air, and ether. There are also five subtle elements. Yes. Smell, uh, taste, color, touch, and sound. We would think of these more as the, we usually would refer to that as the sense objects smell, taste, smell from the nose, taste from the tongue, sound from the ear. Yeah, and that's described next, I think. That's described as the senses for acquiring knowledge and the senses of action. They're given a different category. Because like, the next verse describes this, the senses for acquiring knowledge is the ear, tongue, touch, sight and smell. Yes, but the sense objects are perceived okay. through these different senses. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the objects true. of the senses, the smell, taste, touch, sound. Yeah. And, yeah, and you mentioned color. 
But color is mentioned in the verse there. Are, it, it could be farm. It says um, in the word to word, Gandhiadini uh, um, is grouped into one taste, color, touch, and sound, smell, and so on. Gandhiadini. Hmm. We don't usually hear color mentioned, but form. Yeah. So, uh, then, the, the power. Then this, yeah. Then there's his organs of action, which is the tongue, uh, the the working senses, which I presume is the hands, I didn't say that, but, and then the traveling, that's obviously the legs, and the sense for generations, the genitals, then there's the sense for evacuation. So that's 20 in total. Yes. And the next verse is describe the others. So that would be the devoted covering the next verses. But there should be five, five more elements, though. Yeah. Yes, Maharaji Hare Krishna. Uh, in the next passage, uh, the five elements uh, are there for mind, intelligence, ego, and contaminated consciousness. These are the four. And then 25th one is uh, said as time, which is the mixing factor. Oh. So, and then Sagun and Nibun Brahma is also explained. Everything is uh, included in Brahma because everything is the energy of Brahma. If uh, it is uh, mm, uh, when three modes of nature, it's mixed with three modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, then it is Sagun Brahma because they, that result into material existence. And when uh, there is only unalloyed Satogun without these three modes of material nature, then it's uh, Nirgun Brahma. So, Saguna Brahman is the Brahman, but with qualities. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes we would talk about the deity worship as being Saguna Brahman. We worship the Lord, the form of the Lord. It's Brahman, but with qualities. Could you explain it again, how you described it, Saguna Brahman? Uh, where uh, three modes of nature, uh, it's included, uh, Satoguna, the good uh, mode of passion. Yeah, yeah with, with the three modes, yeah. And uh, that is uh, Sagun Brahman. Do we have examples? Did, does the text, do we have any examples of Saguna Brahman? Uh, it's in, in the purport, uh, Maharaj said that uh, because of that, this material means this material uh, nature has come, this this material world has come. So everything is energy of Brahman, that's why uh, it, it will include it in that Sagun Brahma. Oh, so everything is there within the Saguna Brahman. Yes. And w then what about Nirguna Brahman then? Nirgun Brahman, it said, uh, it's in the spiritual, it's in the spiritual existence, spiritual world. Oh, in the spiritual where, world, uh -huh. where, where there is uh, no effect of these three modes of nature, the unalloyed uh, goodness, mode of goodness. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So Nirguna is describing the spiritual world and Saguna Brahman is material world, the creation. In the beginning, it's Brahman. Okay. Sometimes we do talk about the deity worship as being Saguna Brahman because it's the form of the Lord, but he has qualities, with, with qualities. But it can, we could also consider it to be also Nirguna Brahman <laughs> because it's the Lord, the, the Lord's incarnation. Okay. So we'll go ahead to group number. Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I, may I request you to kindly explain once again this Nirgun and Sagun Brahman. You mentioned that Sagun Brahman is deity worship and uh, the form of the Lord with qualities. Yes, the Lord has qualities, right? His qualities, of course, are always transcendental. So the, to actually 
would say the Lord, the, 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 wor the worship of the deities which we do, we take material elements and the Lord enters into these material elements. So in this way it's a Brahman, but with qualities, Saguna Brahman. But then we could also say, because he is the Lord, because the deity is the Lord, so it's Nirguna Brahman. There's actually no material qualities. We may see material qualities, that's our conditioning, but the Lord is always transcendental. Then uh, there is no difference between Sagun Brahman and Nirgun Brahman, because uh, if the deity worship is there, though it seems to be material elements, but it is transcendental because Lord has entered those deities. Yes, that's the way I understand it. So there is no difference or there is difference? Well, it's a question of how you see it. Somebody may see Saguna Brahman and somebody else sees Nirguna Brahman. It will depend on the individual's vision, his consciousness. Are we, seeing, are we seeing the Lord materially or are we seeing him spiritually? Are you seeing the deity as Krishna directly or are you just simply thinking he's a deity? He's, he's, just, a, he's just deity, he's not Krishna. Are you thinking there's some difference between Krishna and the deity? Then it would be like Saguna Brahman. You mentioned the form of the Lord with qualities, so with what kind of qualities? All the qualities like the six uh, opulences which the Lord possesses? Well, the Lord has many qualities. They are listed in the Nectar of Devotion, right? Sixty-four different qualities are listed there by Rupa Goswami. There's many, many qualities the Lord has. No, Thank you, Maharaj. The Lord is an ocean of qualities. Rupa Goswami just lists 64 to give us some examples. But he has unlimited qualities. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, we'll go ahead to group number two. Text 19 to 30. First of all, define Mahatattva. Yes, Maharaj. After the prakriti, mahatattva, definition of, define of mahatattva, after the prakriti is hesitated by time and then uh, manifested 24 elements and differentiate, that is considered as a, called as a mahatattva, Maharaj. Could you say that again, please, Prabhu? After the uh, prakriti is hesitated by time and manifested 24 elements and differentiated, that is called mahatattva. After Prakriti is manifested by time and differentiates the 24 elements, then it becomes yes. Mahatattva. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. All right. So, what about the next part? Explain consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. So, the consciousness became manifest in Mahatattva. It is a pure goodness or Suddha Sattva status of understanding the personality of God. It is called consciousness or Vasudeva. The preceding deity is Vasudeva. In the Suddha Sattva state, there is no improvement of the other qualities, namely passion and ignorance. And at the beginning, consciousness is pure. And the more one becomes materially contaminated, the more the consciousness becomes obscured. Right. Yes. Conscious, our consciousness becomes contaminated. Originally, our consciousness is pure, right? Prabhupada says like, like that, that we, we come from the spiritual world. Just like the rain falls, the rain is pure, but as soon as it contacts the ground, then it becomes contaminated. Okay, what about false ego? Um, yes, Maharaj. Um, false ego is uh, uh, false ego is like a bit of an identification of one's body as oneself. Um, basically, it's a misconception um, which leads to be you know, forgetful of Krishna. Mm. And also, um, it's a misuse of, uh, it leads to a misuse of uh, our free will or independence. Um, and also, the false ego 
um, ahankara combines with the mode of goodness and evolves into mind. And the presiding deity of false ego um, is Sankarshina. So how to conquer false ego? How to get um, rid of false ego? Uh, by surrendering into the will of the Lord, um, well, by following the processes of bhakti, uh, shravanam, kirtanam, uh, under the direction of the spiritual master. Well, I thought Lord Shiva was the presiding, uh, uh, Sankarshan is the presiding deity of false ego. Don't we have to worship Sankarshan to get rid of false ego? Um, uh, just like when the, when the water, the root is water, everything else is uh, in the tree, everything else is nourished. Similarly, we worship the Supreme Lord, the Sankarshna also, Shiva is also very happy. So he helps us um, get rid of the false ego. So just by worshipping Lord Krishna, we get rid of the false ego. We don't need to worship Lord Shiva or Sankarshan. That's what I think so. Yeah, it's a good point. Very nice. Okay, what about the mind? <coughs> mind is the cause of entanglement due to our forgetful position as servant of the Lord. <clears throat> so when, when, when the, the soul forgets that it is a, it's a part and parcel of Krishna um, and the servant of Krishna, that, that's where the mind comes into play. And um, Anirudh, Aniruddha is the presiding deity, presiding deity of mind. Okay. So mind is, mind is always accepting and rejecting sankalpa vikalpa that dual that duality is always there good bad so it's always wavering between the two that's the quality of the mind and we need to approach the Lord <coughs> to um, get rid of that duality of the mind and concentrate on one aspect of supreme. Hmm. So what's the, how, to con, how to conquer the mind, how to take care of the uh, mind? Concentrating on the lotus feet of the Lord and guiding the senses to serve the Lord Hishikesha. Thereby um, we will be able to overcome the, uh, the jumping nature of the mind. Okay. So, are you also recommending bhakti yoga, or you should we worship Anirudh? Again, um, as it is said before, um, worshiping the supreme Lord will um, will cater to the needs of all other um, um, super preceding deities. Okay, so. If somebody has mental problems, they don't need to worship any root. They just need to chant Hare Krishna, take shelter of Krishna. Yes, in my opinion, that would be a right approach. All right. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. All right, what about intelligence? Yeah, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, intelligence, uh, it appears from false ego in uh, the mode of passion and uh, it basically helps in ascertaining the nature of objects when they come into view and help. They are the guiding force for the senses and uh, they basically, uh, they have some functions also, uh, like characteristics like some doubt, misapprehension, apprehension, correct apprehension and memory and sleep. So they are actually the characteristics of intelligence, Maharaj. Okay. So how do we get a good IQ? By reading the scriptures and following the process of devotional service. And who is the presiding deity again for intelligence? Uh, Maharaj, uh, in the text number uh, 29 and 30, the presiding deity has not been mentioned. So we had 
we had uh, Sankarshan, the presiding deity of false ego, and Anirudh for the mind. Yes, Maharaj. Mm. So Sankarshan, Anirudh, Prajumna, Vasudev, the deity of consciousness. So it must be who's left from the Chaturvyuha? Prajum. Prajum, right. Should be Prajum. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead. Group number three. Summarize the transformations of the gross element. Yes? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, but here it says uh, presiding deity of intelligence is Lord Balaram, but Lord Brahma. <laughs> really? Yeah. Where, where does in, um, uh, in the prophet uh, of uh, 61, by the way back, you know, we are not supposed to, you know, in our, in our discussion, we are not supposed to look at 61, but in 61, it says, um, uh, Prabhupada says, similarly, Lord Brahma appeared, appearing after intelligence is the presiding deity of intelligence. That's text number 61. 61, in the first few lines of purpose. Of this chapter, 26. Ah, yeah, yes, Maharaj. Oh. Okay. So, Prabhupada said, Lord Brahma is the presiding deity of intelligence. And Maharaj, in that same purport, uh, it is also mentioned Lord Shiva is the presiding deity of false ego, which basically, again, is not in line with the false ego uh, presiding deity of Sankarshan. Oh, Sankarshan is Shiva as well. Yes, right, Sankarshan, but it says by worshipping Lord Shiva, uh, what is it? we should worship Lord Shiva as a devotee of Sankarshan. It said Lord Shiva is a devotee of Sankarshan. Actually, Lord Shiva and Sankarshan are practically one and the same. Prabhupada said the, the snakes on the body of Lord Shiva are Sankarshan. It's <laughs> it's somewhat confusing to try to understand how to relate the two, Lord Shiva and Sankarshan. Yeah, we should worship Lord Shiva by worshiping Lord Shiva. You are also worshiping Lord Sankarshan. It's, they don't seem there doesn't seem to be a big difference between the two. That's how I understood it. And we take shelter, you have false ego. It said Lord Shiva, he's the master of false ego. And so we can appeal to him to help us to get rid of the false ego. Or we can simply approach Lord Krishna. And Lord Shiva is also under the shelter of Lord Krishna. And we get the blessings of Lord Shiva if we take shelter of Lord Krishna. All right, some different opinion, different opinions in different places say different things. Sometimes we get that we get these com sometimes contradictions coming up in the purpose. Different opinions by different acharyas. Lord Brahma, of course, he is Adikavaye. He's a, the mo he's a intelli most intelligent. He's got the position to do the creation, so certainly a very intelligent person, a presiding deity, we don't know, I don't know. Maharaj, can I comment on this? Yes. Lord Saraswati emerged from Brahma's mouth and she is considered to be the goddess of learning, intelligence, purity and wisdom. And so Brahma is also the presiding deity of intelligence in that sense. That's what Prabhupada comments here. Where? No, in this in this purport, Prabhupada says that after intelligence is Brahma is there. So it's, well, text sixty one. But Brahma appearing after intelligence is what Prabhupada comments in the purport. Text sixty one. Yeah, text sixty one. So he he, he just uh, it, it is not mentioned here about Lord Saraswati coming from Brahma's mouth, but in that in that sense, it is what is what is being mentioned here is what I assume. Mm. Okay. 
Yes, Pr Prabhu, did you have a hand raised, is it? Prabhu wants to say something? No? Okay. Anyway, from this section, we, we're not, it's not specifically said who is the presiding deity of intelligence. Okay, let's go ahead to the next section. Group 3, transformations of the gross elements. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I was supposed to speak about this. Uh, so, from the ignorance, uh, or, or shall I show, start from Mahatattva, is coming the material ego. Okay. Is, then then it goes to goodness, passion and ignorance. And from the ignorance, <coughs> there is, uh, uh, there is the sound is coming. Is uh, and from the sound is the sense of hearing or an ether. And uh, from the from the ether there is uh, air. Yes. Yes. Just a second. And uh, the sense of touch. All right. Air has a quality of touch. Yes. And, and then, then is the fire, and the uh, uh, visual element of eyes. And uh, the water, and the uh, taste is manifested. And from, the, from that is coming air, and the uh, of that sense of smell is manifested. Okay, yes, fine. Okay, going ahead, group four, the universal coverings. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in the universal coverings, it involves the universal egg or the, uh, or the universe in the shape of an egg, which is called the manifestation of material uh, energy and its layers of water, air, fire, sky, ego and Mahatattva increases in thickness one after the other and uh, each layer is 10 times bigger than the previous one and the final outer layer is covered with Pradhana. So what's, the, what's the first covering? First covering is the uh, layers of water, air, uh, fire, sky, ego First, the first, first water, and then? Then fire, then, then air, then sky, and the ultimate holding crust is Pradhana. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. And uh, Pradhana, and uh, within this egg uh, is a universal form of Lord Hari, of whose body uh, the 14 planetary systems are found. That's how it has been explained uh, in the coming thing. And uh, what practical lessons which I've learned from this is that by this, like we come to know about uh, the Lord, that he is the super, he's super independent and uh, he is the greatest of all them all. And by this, by our false ego is removed. And uh, like we, one can understand his real identity. And then he is actually liberated from the clutches of Maya, and his uh, intelligence always. Then it, he gets purified, and he uh, his mind is uh, he is always his mind is always engaged upon the lotus feet of the supreme personality of Godhead. So and by this he uh, he is freed from the um, uh, material contamination, and he is always jo joyful, and he becomes liberated. And by and then he uh, discharges the devotional services in a in a joyful attitude. So one can understand the science of God by this very easily if he is uh, discharging devotional services in a joyful attitude. Oh. And then he becomes Krishna consciousness. Uh, Krishna conscious. That's what I. Uh, so you're recommending contemplation of the Virata Rup that will help us. It's easy for us to become Krishna conscious. Yeah, like. 
like if uh, people who cannot directly engage in the worship of the transcendental form of the Lord are advised to think of the worship this way, this universal form, in this universal form, that way. Hmm. That is it. Yes, right. Okay, very good, yeah. I have no argument with this. <clears throat> Anybody else has questions or comments? Maharaj, may I ask? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, in the previous uh, chapter that we just covered, uh, it was mentioned that uh, Shukdev Goswami and uh, the four Kumaras, they were impersonalists and they were attracted to the deity forms, uh, to, to the decorated forms of the Lord and the, uh, they smelled uh, the aroma of the Tulsi leaf from the lotus feet of the Lord and then they became devotees. But Shukdev Goswami, I understand that he is a devotee and uh, he is basically giving uh, discourses on Srimad Bhagavatam to Parikshit Maharaj. So uh, how we can understand that Shukdev Goswami being in the spiritual world uh, earlier in the previous birth and uh, having association of the Lord. So how we can understand that uh, the Shukdev Goswami, he became impersonalist when he took birth? Well, it's a pastime. It's for, for Leela, to show the power of Srimad Bhagavatam. We have to understand it in that way. So he basically saw the beautiful form of the Lord and then he became a devotee, Shukdev Goswami. Oh, he, he, he heard Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. But in the, in the notes that we... Uh, was mentioned that he was attracted to the beautiful form of the Lord. So it was uh, basically four Kumaras? The four Kumaras, they were attracted to the beautiful form of the Lord, yes. And uh, Shukdev Goswami became a devotee after hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from Vyasadeva. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so this is the final text here from the chapter. Someone like to read for us? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just carry on. And therefore, through devotion, attachment, and advancement in spiritual knowledge acquired through concentrated devotional service, one should cont contemplate the su that super soul as present in the very body, although simultaneously apart from it. Okay. So, this is a, something, principles of Sankhya Yoga. Devotion, detachment, and advancement in spiritual knowledge. And that spirit, that, how do you get that detachment and devo devotion and knowledge? It all comes through contemplating the super-soul. So, we'll hear about contemplating the super-soul. It comes up, there's a whole chapter on that. Uh, chapter 28, I think it is. So Prabhupada's purport says, the analytical study of the elements of material nature and the concentration of the mind upon the super-soul are the sum and substance of the Sankhya philosophical system. The perfection of the Sankhya Yoga culminates in devotional service unto the Absolute Truth. Here is a nice description of the Sankhya philosophical system. The analytical study of the elements of material creation. We've been looking at something of the elements of the material creation today, going through this chapter. This chapter is really concerned with this, giving us an analytical study of the elements of the creation. And that's only part of the Sankhya philosophy. We have to then concentrate the mind upon the super soul. So there's a combination of the analytical study of the material nature along with the contemplation or meditation upon the super soul. So you see the combination of Astanga Yoga with the 
with the Sankhya, with the Jnana Yoga. And the goal, the perfection, devotional service. So if you can begin at devotional service, if you can take the, take the lift up, right? You don't need to go through Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga. You can, you can simply go directly to Bhakti Yoga. So similarly, there's no need to worry about the other things, just simply do devotional service. The Sankhya Yoga is to bring us to devotional service. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, Maharaj, in the previous slide you mentioned uh, regarding uh, concentrated devotional service in the, the second last slide of this session. Yes. What is the significance, Maharaj, of concentrated uh, concentrated devotional service? Is it basically concentrating the mind on the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord? Well, it's concentrated devotional service means giving up all other affairs, other activities which have no connection with the Lord. Okay, Maharaj. Okay. Being Thank fully you, engaged in the in the service of the Lord by hearing and chanting and remembering and worshipping and offering prayers and doing all of these different things. That is full concentration on devotional service. Right? No time for Maya. Fully engaged in Krishna's service. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. I have a question, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Can you ask me, please? Maharaj, from text number 59 to 70, it talks about awakening the Virat Purusha. And uh, various deities are trying to awaken the Virat Purusha. And finally, in 70, it says that the deity or consciousness, when it enters, uh, it has awakened the uh, Virat Purusha. Um, so, how to understand this, Maharaj? Because Virat Purusha is Lord Vishnu. And uh, a deity of <coughs> demigod who is in charge of uh, consciousness is uh, awakening that uh, Virat Purusha. Yes, well, we're given the description how the different elements, the different organs enter in. But the consciousness doesn't come. There's no, the consciousness comes finally. And it's only once the consciousness comes in that the deity awakens. So, it, it's a very clear presentation. Although we're talking about the Virata Rup, we understand there are different elements to the Virata Rup, right? There's so many different senses and sense organs, everything is there. But without consciousness, then there's, not, there's no life. The Lord is not there. Although the organs and the everything are there, the Lord Himself has entered. The consciousness comes. When the consciousness comes, that is when the, the Lord actually enters in the consciousness. The, the soul is the symptom of consciousness, right? That consciousness is the symptom of the soul. So the Lord Himself comes in the, in the, through, in, in the form of consciousness to bring life to the Virata Rup. He talks about awakening. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. I think it's quite reasonable, without the consciousness, then nothing can happen, nothing's going to take place. It's just simply a dead body, right? Without consciousness, the body's simply dead. But with consciousness, then there will be awareness, there will be activity. We see in the dead body, there's so, in the dead body all the organs are there, the senses are there. There's no life, there's no consciousness. You need, you need the consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Anybody else has a comment or question? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, you know, we uh, highlighted to those exercises that uh, ultimately we should worship Krishna because he is the root of everything. Uh, but like in the Hari Bhakti Vilas by Sanatana Goswami, 
you know, we read Shant Hare Krishna, um, sometimes one can chant the other names, primary names of the Lord, like if one needs to punk fear. Sometimes someone is not on the elevated stage by just chanting Hare Krishna, you know, you would overcome certain problems in your life. So the, the Hare Bhakti Vilas is mentioned that if you want to overcome fear or if you have certain goals or if you want to overcome certain sinful uh, actions uh, or activities, you can chant the different other primary names of the Lord. So I just wanted your comment on this. Well, we're chanting primary names of the Lord. Hare Krishna Mantra is the most primary name, isn't it? Yes. So chanting Hare Krishna. Of course, we have wonderful songs. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has given us so many nice songs to sing the names of the Lord. You know, we sing Yasomati Nandana, that Nam Kirtan, and then Vibhavari Shesha also, it's full of the names of the Lord, commemorating not only the Lord himself, but some of his incarnations and some of his pastimes. So we can remember the Lord by chanting all of these different names. Lord Chaitanya also liked to chant many different songs about the Lord, sing the different names of the Lord. When he was going through Jarakanda, he was also chanting Krishna Krishna and Rama Raghava, Krishna Keshava. And the, the favorite song of Lord Chaitanya was Hare Harai Nama Krishna Yadavai Namaha. And Prabhupada said this is also a Maha Mantra. He said it's a favorite song of Lord Chaitanya. He said we should consider one of them also a Maha Mantra. So we're not just limited to chanting Hare Krishna. There is variety, there is some flexibility there in Krishna consciousness, but mainly the chanting is Hare Krishna. The chanting of our japa is certainly Hare Krishna. And Kirtan, Thank you. with Kirtan we like to do chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, but Prabhupada also wanted us to chant these other songs. He, he expected us to know the meaning, that's also there. That he said, unless you know the meaning, then you don't get any benefit. So when we sing the Bengali songs, the Vaishnava songs, we should also know the meaning. Thank you, Maharaj, that was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So, any other co comments or questions? Okay, so then we'll finish here and we'll meet next weekend and we'll go on to chapter 27 and 28. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Brinda Ki Jai. Yeah.